Um, this time I'm going to be uh, talking more about the a metal level <laughs> uh, on, on libraries. Uh, there's not going to be any code on any of my slides. That's kind of a first for me. Um, because I think I mean uh, I've I've been I've been looking for for sort of very practical solutions, very engineering solutions, but I think the problem, or I've come to the conclusion that the problem uh, in a lot of our domains is not necessarily that level. It's it's kind of on a meta level our, our, our problem. So kind of you know to get everybody on the same page, we're kind of gonna you know let's let's try and define what what libraries are, right? Because, you know, in preparation for this talk, we, you know, at the, at the office, we were kind of, well, what is a library? And there's kind of what, what, you know, people get taught in university what a library is and what sort of I was introduced to a library as, but that's somehow not quite, uh, doesn't quite do it for me. Um, so let's start with sort of what, what a library isn't, right? We, you know, we, we have frameworks, which are, you know, not libraries, which use libraries. And the, the, the definition there is, or, the, or the, the, the discriminator there is pretty easy. You know, frameworks work on sort of the, the Hollywood principle, right? So, so if uh, you are calling code, it's probably a library. And if code is calling you, it's probably a framework, right? So uh, Arduino is a framework. Right, so so Arduino uh, uh, will give you a spot to put your code, and you know, in a in a in a loop, it'll call your code, right? And you can put some callbacks in some places, and then it'll call them in some interrupt context and whatnot. And that actually works quite well. Like the you know the people that were here two days ago for the pre-event, uh, we saw some really really expensive laser equipment, and. Uh, did anyone notice like what was controlling that really, really expensive laser equipment? It was an Arduino, because <laughs> it works, right? Um, and one of the reasons why it works, at least in my opinion, is Arduino is very opinionated, right? Like they, they have an opinion on how you write code and it's easy to be opinionated in a framework, right? Like if you don't do what I will want you to do, then I just won't call you, ha, huh? <laughs> right? Um, and you know when, when I started out, uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to make everything flexible, right? But you know, the problem is uh, you're adding things to the you know the the, the list of things you can do by being flexible. And if you're not enabling things through that flexibility, if you're just adding things, people, you know, allowing people to be more creative, maybe in the way they express themselves, then you're just adding bug potential. <laughs> Right, so you know if if you have a sort of coherent uh, uh, idea or a coherent way of expressing yourself within some domain, um, take everything else off the table. I mean that's basically what uh, Arduino did, right? You're not free to do a whole set of things. That means for a lot of stuff it doesn't work, but for the stuff it's designed for, it actually works pretty good. So frameworks are often opinionated, and that's a good thing, right? So, so where's sort of the definition between library code and, and, and code, right? So I, I think, uh, uh, you know, Herb, Herb Sutter put this quite well in one of his, one of his talks. Like library code, you, you, you kind of, you stumble into success, right? Like you, you, you try and get it wrong and it still works or it gives you an error, right? Like, you know, the, as, as a library author, you try and do really sort of bulletproof interfaces where you're static checking everything where you're uh, um, you offering concepts that don't compile and if you don't use them right right and it, you know that the, the catchphrase is easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly right that's what we so we're trying to do in in, in library code right? and you know uh, a lot of libraries do a pretty good job of this so well well library code is the success baby right uh, User code is often more sort of this baby, right? So, you know, it, it, it works, right? There's, there's kind of a smell problem probably, right? But, but you know, it's, it's, it's the kids still eating ice cream, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is sort of, you know, how I think about user code, right? It's kind of a pragmatic solution to a, to a problem. And 
And, you know, there's stuff you're going to have to deal with down the road, but, you know, that's down the road. And you don't want to show it to anybody. Oops. <clears throat> so, so, so user code's like, it's good enough for now. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe you don't really quite know how to do it yet. <laughs> Right, like you're, but 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 that's okay, right? Because you know the the user user code land, the you know the interfaces aren't aren't frozen, right? There's 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 uh, you you can kind of experiment and and uh, you're not going to break people by changing it, right? Like you know uh, there's there's a scope difference between library code and and user code. Right? Like if, if it's if it's a wide scope where it's used, if it's you know, the scope is even outside your company or outside of your project and other people are using it, well, you're not gonna be able to change that all that often, right? You're gonna have to freeze at least a public interface of that. And throughout this talk we're gonna learn sort of how much how much public interface there is in the public interface of that. <laughs> but uh in sort of your 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 business logic y part of your code base, it's fine to be, you know, a little dirtier, it's fine to, you know, change things. It's because in the in the business logic case, you don't really know what the problem is yet, right? Like you're programming to learn about the problem in a sense. Right? And, you know, especially if you're doing this for some customer, like you're gonna put up some code, they're gonna look at it, and then they're gonna realize, hey, that thing that I wanted, that's not what I really wanted, right? And so if you if your if your customer is not a software person, you're not writing library code on the first try, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> right? But if you're if you're if your user are software engineers that understand like the concepts that you're working in, then uh you know, it can be worthwhile to go in and and uh make the interface more bulletproof and you know, try and come up with a sort of generic e step on off e definition of uh what your library does and what its sort of uh first principles beliefs are and whatnot. Right. This is sort of the understanding that I've come to over a lot of trial and error, like a lot of error in that trial and error. Uh and it's it's like you know, this is sort of what 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 uh, library code was introduced to me as. You know, if you have a bunch of functions about math, well, put that in a math library, right? I don't really agree anymore, right? I, there's a lot more to a library, right? Like if I'm writing a, a math library and uh, I have a bunch of functions about math and they don't have like a common set of types with which one expresses, uh, um, I don't know, complex numbers. If half of them take one complex number type and the other half don't, well, that's, that's not really a library. That's just a bunch of functions. Right? If I haven't thought about, okay, what are, the, what are the pitfalls? What are the ways that you can use my library wrong? Then that's probably not a library. It's probably just a bunch of code, right? And this is probably the most uh, sort of contentious part of uh, libraries. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I would say that libraries are also opinionated and should be, right? They have, there's the, by, by using a library, you are expecting your users, uh, or you are expected as a user to program in a certain way. Right? There's, there's part of the library philosophy that creeps out of the library and into your code. And so the library author's opinion about how one should write code kind of gets, kind of creeps in, right? And um, looking around the room, maybe most of you agree with me, sort of eye contacty. some of you don't. Uh, I'm going to kind of go into that a little more in depth. So I have this piece of code, right? And here we're using, you know, unique pointer, the sort of uh, poster child of resource acquisition is initialization or scope-based resource management, as we should have called it. Uh, the idea here is I'm encapsulating in my unique pointer the, uh, the responsibility of freeing the resource again, right? So all on that one line, let's see if my pointer clicky thingy works. Somehow not. Oops, that's not the right button. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> uh, okay, so so uh, uh, 
in this you that's going to explode because we saw the next slide, right? Uh, uh, we're in, you know encapsulating this responsibility, and we're just assuming, even if we don't look into like all the stuff and dust bunnies and whatever in our code, uh, that this is going to work, right? I mean, if you see this in your code base. Uh, you expect it to be freed at some point. Maybe somebody's moving it somewhere else, someone will free it at some point, right? It, 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 it's not my responsibility, I encapsulated it right, and we're good, right? But that doesn't always do the right thing. Uh, for example, somebody could be using go, go to, right? And you know the, the you know the, the problem with 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 go to is uh you know the go to skips over i'm just going to point like this this curly right where the where the object is destroyed right and go to in order to be really really performant it just goes to right it's in the word and in the name it doesn't go to and make sure nothing breaks it just goes to right so the so the destructor of you is not called because we just skip over the part of the code that calls it right so, so how do we deal with this sort of conflict of, of uh, uh, philosophy, right? We have go to out of C, and we have a uh, unique pointer out of C++11, and they don't really work together that well, right? <laughs> and, you know, the way we deal with this specific problem is we kind of have this dogma, right? Like if it breaks Rye, well, then it's not part of modern C++, right? So, so we don't use GoTo. I know you've probably heard that in a bunch of places. Don't, don't use GoTo. And I don't use GoTo enough that I actually had to look up how to write a label, <laughs> right? This is, this is, I mean, I knew it had something to do with like a weird uh, uh, colon rather than semicolon and whatnot, right? But, but uh this is, this is we, we just say, no, that, that world doesn't exist because it breaks our nice, clean, hygienic world. Okay. But the, and, and, and we see this with, with uh, uh, you know, some other concepts in C++. What's, what's the problem here? Right? This, was, this was a very sort of hot topic in the 90s. <laughs> right? This was kind of the, the proof that, that uh, Strustrup was wrong and... and uh, um, that you know C++ is not you know it's, it's impossible to write safe code in C++ right so so the the problem here is we're doing two things on this line of code right we're taking something out of the queue and we're returning it and if the copy constructor that is called during the return that's copying it into you if that throws an exception well we don't we already took the object out of the queue so the object is just gone now right and if we want to make any sort of uh, exception safety guarantees, and, and we can't just be like losing objects just because something went wrong, right? <clears throat> so there was, you know, there was a lot of people that said, oh, we found the flaw in C++, everybody used Java, right? Because it was the 90s, and that was what everyone was saying, right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, we kind of came up with, well, okay, why don't we do one thing per line, right? We're we're taking something out of the queue, putting it in a U. If that copy constructor throws, then it's still in the queue, right? We didn't pop it out of the queue yet, right? And on the second line, well, we can only get to the second line if the first line works. So we have it in U, and then we can pop it off the queue, and we're fine, right? So we kind of took the way people coded and said, no, 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 that's not right. You have to code differently now because we have exceptions, and you have to make sure that you don't. Uh, uh, kind of break the guarantees of exceptions. Right? So here again, you know, a little more sort of, I guess you could call it dogma, right? Like our way is right. You have to code differently because otherwise our library won't work, right? And and this is sort of fragmented the community a little bit. The games industry is like, yeah, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to go off and do our own thing, right? And then we have, you know, more sort of subtle, subtle problems, right? Like the, you know, the exception problem, probably known by a lot of it. So what, what's the problem here? You know, maybe just, just show of hands, who, who thinks they know what could be unexpected going on here, right? And we, R is just a range, we'll just call it a vector of int for the sake of argument. 
a predicate, just some normal predicate, you know, calling less than for the sake of argument. In sort of your context at work, what could go wrong here? No hands. Either people are not brave enough or people haven't had coffee or people are, I don't know, too sick to raise it. No, I, I'm not going to make jokes about that. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's one thing that's certainly unexpected going on here. Uh, this thing takes a lock, or at least some lock-like thing. Why? Why is an algorithm taking some lock? Well, uh, there are, I think there is like a, you know, uh, inspired by ancient Egyptian math, something very Stepanoffy story, a way to do stable sort without allocating a scratch space, but it's slow. So everyone just allocates a, a scratch space to do stable sort. So there's an allocation going on in the library, and the heap's a shared resource, so there's some kind of synchronization around that, I'm sure, right? Unless they're embedded and they just lie to you, but... Uh, so, I, you know, the new hire that's being onboarded is going to be very surprised that this thing allocates, right? So, so how should we know that this thing allocates? If you go on, on uh, um, uh, CPP reference, which is the good place to look for C++ stuff, not the C... Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, go on CPP reference. It doesn't, even though it's good place, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you that it allocates, right? I mean, I, okay, so the C way of dealing with this problem is obviously not to document it. Uh, it's, well, you know, go look at the C code. You can read the C code. And, and this is one, one way of approaching sort of the problem of documentation in libraries is to write the library in the same subset of C++ that the user code is written in, right? And so, you know, we're, we're C programmers. We have, we have decided to use a, C, a subset of C++ kind of discriminated on age of invention. And uh, so you, you code review the library and see what it's doing. And if there isn't any allocation in there, then yeah. I mean, it has the negative side effect of, you know, look at some C libraries, you have bad dreams for a while, but that wears off, right? What are they doing to that void pointer? Anyway, um, so we, we're kind of noticing there's, there's, there's sort of an opinionatedness even in the standard library, which isn't really communicated well, right? I mean, the, you know, the opinion here is uh, to make your code run faster, which is what you want. I mean, that's almost universal. We want faster code, right? That's, so that's an opinion. And, and, and so since that's what you want, we're going to allocate, which is going to be uh, you know, less of a slowdown for the allocation than it is for the speed up of the algorithm, because you're working on big sets of data. That's the assumption made by the standard library implementers, right? So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of their opinion creeping into kind of the, 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 the inner workings of your, of your code, right? You have, to, you have to have a heap because this thing needs that, right? Or you have to do a bunch of customization stuff, right? But let's take the stable out. What about just sort? Is there still like some gotcha here? Well, trick question. There's always a gotcha, right? But, but uh, what, what is the gotcha here, right? Let's say you're a new hire at Bloomberg. You know, John Lakos got you drunk and you wake up at Bloomberg, right? Uh, <clears throat> what, what could be unexpected here? Well, maybe our R, our vector of int, has some kind of PMR allocator, right? So let's go back and look at this again. So, so uh, you know, the way standard sort is implemented is it's goes through and swaps elements by some algorithm, you know, depending on your library implementation. And we all know that swap can't throw, right? That used to be pretty true. Not anymore. Uh, I mean, the problem with, with uh, PMR allocators, uh, I, mean, I think there's probably a better picture of PMR allocators. Um, <clears throat> the problem with PMR allocators is... Uh, you have, you know, uh, uh, potentially different, different allocators allocating from different pools of, of memory, which have different lifetimes. And that's not encoded into the type because you type erase the allocator. Like that's, that's the whole, uh, um, 
the whole uh, uh, philosophy behind uh, PMR allocators is you you have uh, some virtual function that will allocate you space, and you don't know how that works. And then if you want to swap two elements that were allocated from a PR allocator, well, you have to know their their allocators, right? Um, so I guess this doesn't quite work with my vector of in vector of somethings, right? That have have a PMRL, right? So if you swap them, it actually has to copy them around, right? Because it can't just say, okay, uh, this pointer into this uh, 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 arena and this pointer into this arena, I'm just going to swap those. Well, maybe the new object has a longer lifetime than the old arena, right? So, so uh, with uh, PMR allocators, yeah, you have to copy rather than swap, and copies can you know run out of memory, and so this thing could throw. Right. So when it does throw, right? If it if it throws on swap somewhere, maybe R has you know some longer lifetime global variable. I don't care. Uh, you can't really ever touch it again, right? Because if 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 the if the swap throws, you could leave a moved from object in the in the range, right? You you moved it from in the range to the temporary, and then you tried to move. The temporary, or yeah, you move moved uh, uh, inside the vector, and then you tried to move from the from the temporary back into the vector, and that threw, right? Well, the you know the object itself is destroyed because the temporary is destroyed because you threw an exception, right? And you have a move from object left in the range, and theoretically, you're never supposed to do anything to a move from object, at least the basic the basic expectation, besides assign to it a new value or destroy it, right? So if you wanted to sort this thing again, that would be kind of at least implementation uh, behavior land. So we don't really have a word for this kind of opinionatedness that I've been describing so far. And since I've had a great history of naming things correctly on the first try, I'm going to call this library ideology. Uh, so, you know, the, the, what does the word ideology mean? Well, it was invented by some French dude, obviously picture of a French guy. Um, and uh, <laughs> originally meant that, you know, the, the, the science of ideas, but I guess according to Webster's Dictionary, it's changed. It's a systematic body of concepts. That's an ideology, right? And this, this kind of works as a word, right? Like there's, there's a bunch of concepts that uh, a library assumes to be true. Right? I assume there is a heap. I assume I can allocate things from this heap without breaking the world. Right? I assume that uh, uh, swap doesn't throw. Except in Bloomberg land, or, or people using PLMR allocators land, where it could throw. And then I have to make different assumptions. Right? Because I have sort of two ideologies that are competing over, you know, what your understanding of that particular piece of code should be. So more of a formal de definition. I should have switched this slide earlier. Anyway, uh, so so the library ideology is kind of the the part of the interface to the library that's not expressed in code, at least directly. Right? There's a lot more to a library than just its public interface functions and its and its vocabulary types. Right? Vocabulary type being anything that goes through the public interface. Well, that's going to be uh, observable from your entire program, so if you freeze the interface, you also have to freeze the interface of all the data types that go through that interface, right? And so, so this is kind of the thing that we classically understand as the interface to a library. But there's actually a lot more interface to that library. There's a lot more observable behavior to a library than just its public interface, right? There's its, there's its ideology, if you will, right? And so there's, there's expectations of, yeah, just don't do that, <laughs> right? Uh, a good example for, for uh, PMR allocators, there's this concept of, of uh, winking memory out, which kind of weird name. Anyway, the idea is if you're doing some computation and from that computation you're getting a result, and then once you have that result, that entire you know, space that you allocated, all those nodes, all those uh, objects and whatnot, you don't need that anymore because you have the result, right? It's kind of a one-off, do this computation work and we're done now, right? And the idea is, well, if I know that that's my use pattern, then I can give everything, you know, a, a PMR allocator that just allocates from some, I don't know, monotonic uh, uh, allocator or something. And then 
when I'm done, I don't have to run all the destructors because all they're doing is giving back the memory that I can just wink out, right? I can just say, okay, here's, here's this block of memory back, Malik. <laughs> Let's free this thing. And it doesn't matter that there are objects whose lifetimes are still in this thing. Uh, you know, it, it leads to a lot of interesting optimization problems, whatever, anyway, but, but uh, uh, it means that there is the assumption that all of your uh, destructors are only managing memory that you got from this particular arena. Because if they're not run, then you're not giving back locks, you're not giving back memory you got from somewhere else, you're not giving back sockets. You just don't put that stuff in the destructor, or, you know, manage that in the destructors of objects you allocated from this allocator. And that's a huge assumption, obviously, right? <clears throat> and, but, but, but it is part of the interface, right? You know, the, the opinion of this library is don't code that way, right? Don't, don't have your scope-based lock be managed by your uh, uh, object that has a PMR allocator. Don't do that, right? At least this type of PMR, there are other PMR allocators, right? So, so all of these examples have been outside of most of our domains, right? You know, they've been sort of uh, in uh, server Cody land, in app dev land, and not so much, uh, uh, you know, microcontrollers or GPU, GP, GPU stuff, or you know, what 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 uh, people who come to this conference kind of are are working in, you know, s scarce resources, whatever, right? Like there's, there is, there is this, uh, there is this domain where we have certain basic assumptions, you know, up until C++ 11, we assumed, at least according to C++, we're running on one thread, <laughs> right? There are no other threads. <laughs> uh, we assumed there's enough memory. That's kind of an implicit assumption in that we don't handle it properly if there's not, right? So we're kind of making this assumption there will be enough memory, <laughs> right? We assume that the goal of the programmer is to have, you know, best throughput in sort of an amortized sense, right? We don't really care about worst case as long as it's not that often. We care about sort of the average speed. And then, okay, maybe if you're doing a GUI, maybe a little sort of reactive and the sort of the time domain is creeping in there, but, you know, uh, I mean, I obviously haven't ever experienced slow running software and haven't automatically concluded it must be Java. Um, <clears throat> sort of your, your round robin scheduler, you know, classic locky whatever uh, uh, world is not very good at the time domain, right? I mean, the number of guarantees they give you is usually zero, <laughs> right? You usually don't even get a forward progress guarantee because that's hard, right? Uh, it's it's really hard to reason about the time domain to begin with, especially if we're you know, we're we're lying to ourselves in a sense, and in an incredible uh, incredible like you know okay, the C plus plus abstract machine is no longer just a von Neumann simplified von Neumann machine. It's you know some uh, parallel uh, 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 machine, but it's still sort of word at a time in order instruction, uh, execution, whatever. That's kind of what, what we're, what we're uh, telling ourselves how the world works from a sort of compiler interfacey kind of a way, right? And that's not true, right? They, you know, the, the processor will do uh, analysis on your chain of assembler and do sort of people optimizations and do out of order execution and you have caching, you have all this stuff in the real world which is not reflected by the interface which you program against, right? So the time domain is really hard. The space domain is hard, right? Okay, what if we, what if we admit there might not be enough memory, <laughs> right? Suddenly the world changes, right? Ironically, <clears throat> when you sort of get into the, maybe I should make some kind of guarantees that I'm not gonna run out of memory. Then you get back into the time domain, right? Because people send you stuff. And either you have to store it away and react to it later, or react to it fast enough. One of the two. So, so uh, having limits on your memory resources usually means, at least if you're interacting with the world, which you usually are, that you have limits in the time domain. Right? We, 
we maybe have have uh uh requirements in the in the uh energy use domain if you will right like a lot of us write code that has to sleep so we we have to admit to ourselves that not all address space is created equal some of that memory is going to be gone after a sleep it's not persistent some of it it's not going to be gone well how do we really tell c plus plus where to put stuff well we can write like a 10 page linker script because that's fun no but uh <clears throat> still like you know how, how do we how do we uh uh how do we tell c plus plus library space or boost libraries or whatever where, where to put stuff we, we can't really because that's not a concept that these libraries sort of understand right it's it's not part of their ideology it's not part of their world micromanaging where memory goes right or even knowing who's who's taking memory in the first place right like uh you know, uh, static or inline variables deep in some library, they're not going to tell you about it, right? Because we're bad about communicating what our impact is on, on the world from a library standpoint, right? So non-persistent memory is a problem, right? We have ex externally observable memory, right? And uh, if, 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 if I'm writing to some GPI report for the sake of argument, I better be doing that in the right order <laughs> with somewhat the right timing, right? And, and we can't just uh, assume that, that uh, if nobody's reading it, I can just not write it as an optimization. So, you know, we can, we can go in and hit the compiler over the head with volatile, but that, that's, you know, for one, killing optimization, and it's also not always quite what we want, right? So, so we, have, we have requirements that don't sort of fit into this classic, uh, you know, Van Neumann-y uh, abstract machine that C++ gives us, plus, plus threads, <laughs> right? Um, or, or any other language for that matter, right? Uh, you know, they, they all have some abstract machine, which usually doesn't quite fit our requirements, right? So, so this is this is kind of this is why we can't have nice things, <laughs> right? And and so the problem is like, how do we talk about this? How do we communicate why our requirements break the library ideology of the standard library or break the library ideology of Boost? Like, why can't we use them, and what can we use? There's something that's pretty hard to talk about. At least I've found because there's not a lot of other people talking about it, right? We haven't, we haven't developed sort of a, a, a nomenclature and, and, and a sort of installed base of knowledge you can expect people to have about uh, library requirements, right? And I've, I mean, I've been noticing this at the, uh, you know, the standards committee around the whole uh, um, exception debate, right? Yeah, you know, it used to be there was kind of standard committee was exceptions are the greatest thing since sliced bread because the happy path is the fastest. It's the fastest happy path you can ever do. Like the happy path is where you don't have an error, right? So we don't care how fa you know, how slow the error path is because that's not common, right? Common path is the happy path and we want to optimize that as much as we possibly can. That's the goal, right? Well, that's, that's an opinion. That's an assumption. That's not always true. It's not true for a lot of our domains because we care about the the sad path. <laughs> we, we, we care about how long it takes when stuff goes wrong because we have to do other stuff too, right? Which also has uh, uh, latency guarantees, right? So, so, okay, maybe it almost always works except for when it throws an exception and then it starves all my other processes. Well, we can't have that, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, games industry was just, okay, we're going to do our own C++ thing. Embedded domain, well, we're just going to use C. Uh, and in the last you know, year or two, there have been a lot of other people coming to the standards committee and saying, hey, no, really, we have different requirements. Or we have different requirements, we have ideas on how to do this. And uh, this is really, really healthy for, for people to be able to express why they actually can't use exceptions rather than just sort of Reddit flame war or whatever, right? Like, what are your requirements? We want some kind of universal error handling. And we have some set of requirements that uh, uh, um, make it so that we can't use what people have come up with in the form of exceptions. And, and, and uh, 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 you know, people who I would have expected would be very sort of, no, let's leave it the way it is. Like, Starstrup has been very helpful, very, you know, 
uh, uh, encouraging of, of other concepts in this space uh, as long as they don't break all the other people, but that is possible, right? Like if we can, we, we, we can come up with ways of expressing what our requirements are, right? Because, I mean, it's easy to like just, you know, go hide in a basement because that's where there's less light and it's all good and, and, and you can just code and, and you know, your, your ID loves you. And uh, it, it's hard to talk about what, what sort of the problems are, right? And, and, you know, one of the things that I think is going to gonna help here is sort of this is kind of the zeitgeist right now. We have Alex Andrescu talking about design by introspection. And since he named it, <laughs> since he gave us semantics to talk about this, we can talk about design by introspection, right? The idea is I write a library that works differently based on properties that I can introspect from the types that you give me, right? So if you give me a swap that throws, well, maybe I'm going to do a different implementation than if you give me a swap that can't throw, right? And you know, if I'm writing a generic swap, then uh, I'm going to be conditionally no accept, maybe, right? We have conditional no accept now, right? So we can introspect, hey, thing, do you have a no accept uh, copy constructor? Well, I can make a no accept swap out of that, right? <clears throat> this can help. This is kind of bringing us back to sort of the stated goal of generic code, which, you know, the standard library tries to be and, and was, you know, especially at the time was incredibly generic. Question is, can we be generic enough that we make everybody happy? And I think not. Like, it's, it's a valiant goal and it's something like it, it is the best solution to be uh, generic enough that uh, everyone's happy. Like we have allocators you can put in things if you want to do allocation differently. You just, not everything, sadly, but, um, and there are ways that we can be sort of more generic. I mean, I've been putting work into sort of how do we do better mixing stuff, but there's kind of a combinatorial complexity problem there, right? As soon as you're composing objects out of a lot of policies, then you have a lot of combinations to test more than you're actually going to test, right? Because it, it's, it's an exponential function, right? So this kind of brings us back to like, who are we as a conference, right? Like, we're, we're the misfits. We're the people who have weird problems, right? We're, I mean, maybe some of you just like beer, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, as, as a conference, uh, we are the people who have requirements on uh, our solutions that don't us allow us to live in this world where everything builds on pthreads and there's enough memory and we're all good, right? Uh, we have timing constraints, we have space constraints, we have determinism constraints, we have weird hardware architecture and we have to acknowledge that we have real hardware. I mean, everybody has weird hardware architecture, but then you just put a layer of abstraction on it and for most people that works, right? And so kind of at EMBO, we are just a selection of, of people who are breaking the world because we're working on the problems that break the world. And so uh, the thing is, we're kind of the ones that have to solve this, right? Because we have this problem earlier than other people, but everyone will eventually have this problem, right? Hardware is not getting more similar to the old von Norman architecture, right? Uh, caches are not getting closer, <laughs> right? Uh, there is a divergence between abstract machine and, and library interfaces, which one commonly programs against, and the real world. And we have to acknowledge this first, but everybody will at some point, right? So, so I, I, I don't have the answers to a lot of these questions, right? I mean, a lot of the kind of the core part of the talk is how do we solve this, <laughs> right? We, we have uh, different assumptions about the world that we have to make. We have different requirements about the world, you know, the, 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 uh, the system that we're programming in which we have to make in order to solve the problem, right? And how, how do we talk about those? What is, what is the semantics to talk about those in? And, and how, do we, how do we document libraries such that I know if I can use that library, if, you know, if its ideology will conflict with my ideology in you know, an ideological technical sense, right? You know, c can I use that? It's, it's very hard to find the right words to say, 
I can use this, I can't use this, and this is why, <laughs> right? And so, you know, I hope throughout uh, uh, the two days that we're all here that we talk about this, right? That we come up with ideas. I, you know, I think that this is kind of the, the problem that we are facing right now as a community is how do we communicate why we can't have nice things? Because if we can do that, maybe eventually we can have nice things. And so in closing, let the soldering unicorns inspire you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.